This is the Kestrel Country Podcast, where we discuss the people, places, and events all around Kestrel Country. Um, yeah, and we'll just talk, just ask you questions and we'll talk about logging and North Idaho and all that. Perfect. While we drink our beers, yep. which is nice. <laughs> so Jesse Haynes. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the podcast. You bet. Yeah. I thought it'd be super fun. I mean, so we've done some about local agriculture. We've done about a bunch of local businesses, but we haven't talked logging before and it is a huge part of the industry around here. Yeah. There's a lot of people that do it here. Yeah. So I thought it'd be fun to talk a little bit to somebody who does logging. It's Jesse Haynes logging. Yep. Is Jesse what Haynes you do, logging. Right? Yep. Yep. So that's what I do. I did some, some tree removal stuff when I f- first went out on my own. Okay. Like six, seven years ago. And then did private ground, logged private ground for about five years. And then in the last year I converted back to logging corporate ground and subbing. To so a, what does subbing mean? <clears throat> so subcontracting okay. my machine and me. There you go. So I'm running my machine for another outfit. Gotcha. Yep. So where did you grow up? In plumber. Okay. Born and raised a plumber. Um, grew up on a ranch, 650, 700 acres. Um, grew up logging. And when you say ranch, was it a cattle ranch? Yep. Yep. My grandpa had cattle. Okay. Um, not a ton, but. A, a fair amount. And so, yeah, it was around cows all grown up timber, you know, started to run chainsaw and skid logs at 10, 10, 11 years old. Wow. And was that a family business then as no. well? Or was it just something you, it was just something that we, about? that we did. I mean, okay. grandpa always took off, you know, a certain amount of logs. There was, you know, 400 acres of, of timber ground. And so it was a source of income and it needed, you know, cut. Okay. And then we'd get firewood on top of that. So he would do it himself on his own ground. And then does somebody come and pick that up and get sold or, um, when I first started, he was still loading and hauling his own logs too. He had a little old log truck and loader and was still doing that. And then, Oh, by the time I was probably 15 or so, he started to have a self loader, hire a self loader to come haul the logs. But, yeah. So when you're doing it, when somebody like that is doing it themselves, um, they're not like, well, I guess how many loads of logs would he sell a year? It, it would vary. Um, probably somewhere between 20 and 30. Okay. Something and like is that. that just like direct to a mill? Is that how that works? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. There used to be a, a larger sawmill and plumber that took the larger logs and, most of it went there. And then later on stuff started going to St. Mary's okay, to the Potlatch mill and then Stimson. And what kind, what primarily, um, what kind of trees, what kind of wood were they? Uh, red fir, white fir. We did very little pine Okay, growing up. We had it, but the, the market's just never great for pine. So, so is that, is that generally going into studs? Yep. Is that, yep. The, re- the larger red fir gets peeled. Uh, for plywood. Okay. And then smaller red fir gets sawed into just stub, stub material. And sometimes they peel the, the white fir, but it's generally just stub material. Okay. Yeah. Is there a plywood plant nearby too then, or do they do that at the mill? They peel it and then they send that off to a plywood plant somewhere else? Or? So the potlatch or potlatch Deltic now in St. Mary's has a sawmill side and a plywood side. So they got two, okay. two complete sides there. Do both. Gotcha. And that's like true plywood, not OSB. No, that's actual plywood. Yeah. And they do all kinds of like custom marine plywood, like super, super thick, heavy stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. Crazy to, yeah, I don't know. It, it's easy to drive by all those places and not really think about what they're doing and what's what coming out of into them. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're, you were growing up, grew, grew up up there and kind of got into it just helping your grandpa. Yep. And was it something you thought at that point you would do long term? I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I liked it. Um, I always wanted to be a small engine mechanic. Oh, really? Like I wanted to rebuild 
motorcycles and chainsaws and stuff like that. Snowmobiles. And I was decent at it, but there's just no money in it. There's just, there's no money in it. So yeah, I got a chance to go. I think I was 20, 20 or 21. And I got a chance to, to work for a guy in potlatch here, cat logging and work commercially. And yeah, been in the woods ever since. So, yeah. So what, um, it's obviously a way to make a living, but is it something that you just love being out there? Is, is that a big appeal yes. to yeah. that business? It's a blast. Like every day going out, being in the outdoors, seeing the scenery, seeing the animals. I mean, yeah, it, it's a blast just to get out in the outdoors every day, even though I'm stuck. I mean, I'm in a machine now, so it's not, you know, like I'm super physically working hard and not in the, in the outdoors, but it's still fun. Yeah. So you just said you're in a machine now. Is that, do you start just with a chainsaw? Or like how, how does that, yeah, I guess. So yeah. How does I, that business work? When I, when I first started, um, that first job I got, I was running a chainsaw on a landing. Um, there was a D six cat skidding trees in, putting them in a pile and I would have to bump any limbs or knots that were left, cut those off and then measure them and cut them into logs. And I did that for probably a year. Okay. That's like low man on the totem pole. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of work. Landing saws is, is kind of a starter job. Do they still do it that way or do they, is it, all, has that been kind of automated? Yeah, I don't. I don't know anybody commercially, you know, this this of any size that does that. It okay. maybe some small jippo guy, like when I do my like private stuff. You know, I'll do that sometimes, but nobody big does that. It's just too slow. Okay. You know, you can buck three loads in a day, three four loads in a day, and you know, processor can cut fifteen loads in a day. So, wow. so were you, that was on a commercial crew though. Yep. yep. So were those kind of machines like the processor not around yet or just um, more? He was a little more old school. By? He was a little okay. more old school. Um, he did have one. It just didn't get used as much. And just yeah. doing it, doing it the old way. Yeah. He, he liked doing things the old way, okay. which was good. I mean, it's fun. Yeah. Running a chainsaw is a blast. So. So you started running a chainsaw on the landing and then where do you go from, where did you go from there? So from there I went to another employer and started running processor, a stroke, stroke dilemma. And I was in that about a year and then came back to the first employer that I had and hooked on her line machine, like fell, fell trees, did a lot of miscellaneous stuff for about a year year and a half. And then I got into a processor again, a stroke dilemma and been in a processor ever since then pretty much. So, so what like describe a processor? So what does that so look the, like? What does that do? Yeah. The, the stroke dilemma has a, it's an excavator carrier. It's got a big boom, um, 50, 60 foot boom and it goes in and out. It's got a set of grapple knives on the, on the front, on the end of the boom that strip the limbs off the tree. It's got a set of grab arm knives on the back, on the base part that doesn't move, that holds the tree. And then it's got a measuring encoder that runs off the, the, the we the wheel that, that makes the boom go in and out. Okay. That keeps track of your measurements. So you get accurate links. So it's grabbing the, grabbing the tree, pulling it essentially through those blades. So you or, grab you grab the tree, pull it back to you, and then grab on with the rear the rear grab arms and then and then those front knives on that boom, they strip the limbs off and it's got a hydraulic saw up there. And yeah, you cut it into log links. And it just cuts in and then throw that log in. So it's like island. literally doing all the things that yep. you were doing before, just yep. on a big piece of machinery. Yep. Yep. So they'll they're coming, they're the logs are being cut. Well, not the large trees. Cut. The yeah. Trees are being cut. Yep. A sawyer, elsewhere. sawyer or buncher or somebody's okay. is falling them. And then they're either getting skidded to the road with a, a lime machine or a, you know, a, a shovel, a, a log loader, you know, they're getting to the road where I can get at them. And then the machine I've got now is a dangle head 
which kind of it, the end product is the same thing as a stroker. It's just a small head with feed wheels and it's a lot more movement and less, less controlled. Is it faster? Yes. Okay. Yeah, much faster. That's the reason. Yep. Yep. Okay. So there, um, you said line machine. Is that, I mean, I, I know, obviously know next to nothing about logging, <laughs> right? That's why I'm asking all these questions, but you know, I've, I've seen some stuff. Is that where they're literally like, you're talking a line yep, on cable. like steeper terrain, Yep. a cable. So they're yep. hauling logs up. Yep, and is that be generally because it's just steep enough that you can't get machinery on it? Or is that kind of faster anyway? No, it's not faster um, all the time. It's generally if it's too steep for a, like a cat cat or a, a shovel log to, to do, if it's too steep for that, or if there's something else like a, a class two or class one stream in the bottom or something like that. That you can't. That you have to be protective. Yeah. You so you protected. Yeah. You, okay. So you can't get a machine in there to do that. You know, you've got to take it up uphill to another road or even downhill. We've got a job coming up that's going to be downhill skidding across the river. So. Hmm. So do those like those line machines? How um, is that cable moving all the time to get to where the logs are, or is there some? Is there another? Um, is there another way that the the trees that are that have been felled get to where the line is to head up to you? No, so yeah, once the trees are felled, they stay there, and then the, the line, line comes to them. The line comes to them. Yep. So the the skyline will get set up. You'll set a skyline up, tie it off to a stump or tree or set of trees, and then it's got a carriage with another line that goes down the hill, and then it's a hydraulic carriage got a motor, and then it'll spit. You've got controls on your belt. It'll spit chokers out, grab the chokers, you hook trees, and then you send them up the hill. Once you're, you've cleared, you know, whatever, however wide a swath on that line, then you unhook your tail hold, you pull it all up, and you move over, you know, 40, 50, 80 feet, however far you're going to move, and you run it down, you tie it off again, and you do the same thing. Gotcha. And then the, the line machine is also guide back. It's got cables that, that go off the top of the boom behind it to keep it from you know tipping over or falling off the hill oh yeah right because that's a lot of that's a lot of a lot of a lot of tension tension on that when yeah you, when you get you know a three-quarter inch line out a thousand feet or something and then you know pull trees up the hill it's yeah substantial and those things are flying they're moving pretty good they move pretty fast hill. yep yep is is that obviously logging has a reputation being pretty dangerous Yep. Business, right? Is that where a lot of accidents happen or is there a particular thing that tends to be the most dangerous part of logging? Yeah. I would, all of it. <laughs> um, I think, I think hooking is probably one of the, the, the most, most danger. I mean, that's fun. put, that's hooking the choker to the tree. Yep. Hooking the choker to the tree. And I mean, getting out of the way, getting out of the way. And that's generally you get complacent and you, you know, don't clear out as far as you should. And, you know, something catches and it whips around and I mean, that's dangerous. It, falling trees is not safe either. I mean, I used to think that running machine was like the, that was the job. Like it was safe until I fell out of the machine and broke my back. And I was like, okay, so <laughs> Whoa. that wasn't, that wasn't true, but you, yeah. get, you get complacent in about every area and that's when accidents happen. That's when the accidents so, happen. Yep. Yeah. Um, You've got all your fingers. Yeah, I've got all my fingers still. Yeah. <laughs> is that rare? Like, honestly? Um, no. Or is no. that another kind of legend, myth kind of thing? Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, one of the guys maybe work with has a couple fingers missing. but Maybe doing stuff the old school way more. Yeah. You used to probably have those kind of problems. I think there's more carpenters with missing fingers than loggers for sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. More Cirque saw accidents, yep. and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, tell us what happened with falling out of a machine. <clears throat> Not paying attention. Um, and this was a big. This was a processor. Yep. This was a Danglehead processor, a Medill carrier. 
So it was a rear entry cab, uh, the, the, so the hood tips up on those to access the motor and everything. I can't even remember why I had the hood up. Like I have, I don't remember. Anyways, I, I stepped out of the back of it without looking back. I popped the door open and just stepped back and the hood wasn't there to step on. Oh. And so I just, just fell. Just fell out. Yep. Landed upside Whoa. down, bullet in half, crushed my T12. How, how break. far a ball is that? Oh, it's probably 10, 12 feet, something like that. It was far enough. Yeah. And you just land on the ground or did you land on? Yeah, it was on the ground. On equipment. Yeah. 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 Ooh. So how, what, uh, was there, obviously you're up and around and working. Was that a long recovery? No, they, they, <laughs> they misdiagnosed it. They, they told me I, uh, I broke a muscle. That's what they, they took x-rays and everything told me I broke a muscle. Um, went back to work like three days later, three days later. And it kept hurting, you know, it kept hurting. <laughs> and like a month, month and a half later, it was still hurting like bad. Went back in by then there was enough, uh, the bone had started to recover. Like, so you could see it in an x-ray a lot clearer. And they're like, Oh no, you, you crushed your T12. And they're like, well, it's, it's healed enough now. It's nothing really more you can do. And that's, that's just it. That's just it. So there's scar tissue there above and below that. And, but crazy. Yeah. When, how long ago was that? I think 2012 or 13, maybe somewhere in there. Okay. 10 years. Yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. And it was right before Thanksgiving. Right. About this time of year. Wow. And that, is that the only accident you've had? Uh, it was the worst one, probably. Were you that? Were you working then for? By, I, were you by yourself, or was this when you were working for another outfit? I was working for the the guy I'm subbing for now. Okay. Um, I was quite a ways away from everybody else, so I mean, I I still had to get to my pickup and stuff. So that was not fun. But oh wow, how far how far was that? Ah, uh, probably only a couple hundred yards. Okay, but it was like but crawl a terrible. It was, it was couple bad. hundred yards. Yep. Did you think you broke your back? I thought I had, cause I heard it pop. Like when I folded it, it went pop. So oh. I thought I did, but. Oh, man. And you, you didn't drive yourself to the hospital. I drove down like a quarter mile down the, down the road. And one of the other guys I was working with was like, no, no, <laughs> I'm going to drive you. So. Wow. Yep. So out of how many years have you been logging? Commercially 20 one okay 21 years and how and you said six or so years on your own yep okay yep and with was that literally on your own you're kind of there by yourself most of that was completely on my own i had my brother help me uh for about a year year and a half he helped okay and then my boys boys had helped during the summers and stuff when they weren't doing school they'd come and saw landing run skitter what was that like moving to, to doing it on your own? Was that a, a big leap? Did that feel? It was a lot different. Yep. Definitely different. Did um, you have to buy all your own equipment or do you lease equipment or how, like, how does that? So I started out borrowing my brother's skitter, renting my brother's skitter. Okay. And then purchased my own skitter, um, bought a pull through dilemma. So it basically did the job of a stroker only it was on the ground and you pulled it through that. Hmm. Okay. So just stripped the limbs off for you. Yeah. And then I think three or four years in, I bought a, a dangle head processor, which I run now. And yeah, I bought a high track dozer too. Yep. A lot of equipment. Is that pull, for pulling logs? What, what do you use the dozer for? Um, clear it, clearing roads, building roads, um, and skidding sometimes. It's not as fast as a wheel skitter. So, so you build a road, you've got to, if, if you're going to log a big area, you kind of have to figure out how to get where you're going to go. Um, and being on your own, was that all your game plan? Yep. Yep. I had to figure out, you know, how I'm going to get the trees to where they can be hauled. So if that was putting a trail in, putting a road in, had to do that. Yeah. Was that fun? Do you like yes. that part of it? Yes. I love, I love moving dirt, love dozing, love figuring stuff out like that. It's fun. Yeah. Did you have some, what, what was your craziest experience? Uh, 
or Cra- like craziest probably rolling my dozer that was that was probably the craziest that was more recent wasn't it yeah a couple years ago a couple years ago yep yep so how does that happen <laughs> <laughs> uh g- getting on too steep a ground and then yeah trying to turn around on too steep a ground yep that was soft to boot so did you go side sideways yep sideways and luckily it didn't roll it just went up up on its top but okay that's a big heavy piece of equipment though yep it's a big piece of equipment to flop on its top and and it was way up the mountain so we had to build a 20 foot road to get all the way up there dug an entire pad around it moved a lot of dirt before we could flip it back up and get it upright wow did you flip it kind of downhill then no, or did you go back up. up the way you kind of yep, came? pulled it up. Okay. Had a really, really big excavator. Wow. So yeah, hopefully that was a learning thing. I, that, I hope that <laughs> never happened. Hope to again. never do that again. It's one thing to flip a wheel skitter. I mean, that's pretty easy to do, but yeah, flipping a high track is something I don't plan on doing again. So. Yeah. Um, that's so what do you do in that kind of, I'm not in that instance rolling it, but, um, when you have ground that steep, is there, is it the kind of thing where you're, you kind of reach your limit as far as being a one man show, what you can yes. do and you kind of have to rely on something, somebody has a line machine and yep. those kind of things. Yep. I should have, I should have realized <laughs> I was beyond what I should have been doing there and just left that, you know, there was this little draw timber, super nice wood, Lots of poles, cedar poles, really wanted to get it out, trying to find a way to get it out. And yeah, that wasn't a good way. Cedar pole. So is that kind of the, is that the gold? That's, that's high dollar. Yep. High dollar stuff. That's triple quadruple the price of, of standard, like saw log material, like stud material. So, and that those are for power poles, power poles. Yep. Okay. Yep. What makes a, a cedar pole? What, what is there criteria yes. that it has to yep. meet? Yep. There's a, there's a pull card. Um, the smallest poles start out at 35 or 37 feet. They add two, two feet for trim. Um, they have to have a 12 inch ground line. So six feet up, they have to have a diameter of 12 inches and a top of seven. Okay. And then that goes up from there. I mean, every five foot increment is a, another pole, a new set of specs and more valuable. The bigger they get or just because they're, there's more material, right? There. There's more material there. So it's going to scale more. It's going to have more board feet in it. Once you get to 65 foot and longer, the price does increase. It generally takes a, a decent jump, another couple hundred bucks, a thousand or something. Okay. And where do you find that, that kind of thing around here? Is that more like where you, you were up off the Joe yep, and that is up on the Joe up there. And that was great timber up there. Um, I've cut some really nice poles on the South side of Moscow mountain here. Um, really, really nice poles on the South side. Yep. On this side. Okay. Down at the bottom kind of, is there, yeah. Is there a particular, do they like it a particular place or is it just kind of whatever? It's just, it's just wherever, wherever they're they happy to grow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause not everywhere grows cedar. Well, so have you spent the majority of your time in one place or another logging? No, I've been all over the place. I mean, Grangeville area, oh, wow. up the Joe, back in behind Clark in the floodwoods. I mean. Is there a favorite place you have after being all those different places? I like the floodwoods. It's, I mean, it's, it's pretty back there. Why is it, it called closer. the floodwoods? Uh, there's floodwood Creek. Okay. Back there. I'm, I'm guessing that's probably why it's called the floodwoods or maybe that's maybe somebody else might call it a different name, but is it, I get the picture of like flatter, lower. Is it not, not necessarily? It's not, no, it's more, it's, it's a lot of hills. Named after the Creek. Yes. Any after the Creek. No. Okay. So it's yeah. Lots of hills, lots of timber. And that's up the kind of the North end of Dvorak. Yep. Yep. A little more fork up that area. Okay. Yep. What do you like about it? Just, is it, it's pretty, it's just gorgeous back there. You got big, you know, there's some pretty good sized mountains behind you. Um, you've got the reservoir there. Great fishing. Generally lots of animals, lots of elk. Yeah. So. Um, 
are right up to the reservoir then? Or are you kind of logging real close to it? Um, I've never logged back there right next to the reservoir. It's, you know, that's all core of engineer ground oh, and right. there's not a lot of logging that they do. Um, some, but it's, it's pretty, pretty small amount. Okay. Mostly the corporate timber ground. Yeah. Is what you're logging. Yep. Yep. Pollock, and, Deltic and Bennett's. Yep. And they just contract with these logging outfits basically to take, take trees out. Yep. Yep. Okay. There's, there's quite a few different outfits that, that cut timber. So, yeah. So what's the, what's one of the craziest things you've seen like animal wise being out in the woods? Seen a wolf, saw a wolf back there. That was one of the only times I've seen a wolf. Is that from like from your, you're in the machine. I was in my machine. Running. Yeah. So I was in my machine walking to my, my stroker out to a, to a different spot. And yeah, this wolf just ran across the road in front of me and stood there on hmm. the end of the road. Do the animals get used to the logging activity then for in sure. a lot of ways? For sure. Yeah. Okay. No, in the winter time when snow gets somewhat deep, if there's elk around, I mean, they'll come in within a couple hundred feet of you and they'll be eating. Oh, that's awesome. Eating needles and eating branches and, and they don't care like clanging and all the noise and they just, they just get used to it. They just go on yep. their merry way, which is fun to watch. Yeah. No so. kidding. Have you seen like big herds of elk at any given time or anything like that? No, I haven't seen any real big herds. Um, 20, 30. I mean, nothing big, but yeah. Other predators besides wolves or besides the wolf cougar I've seen a couple, couple, two, three cougars, bobcats. Oh, that'd be cool. Bobcats. I don't think cool. I've ever seen a bobcat in a while. Oh, they're neat. Yeah. They're a really cool critter. The same thing. You're making noise. You're doing your thing. And they just, those are generally when, or... when we're, when I'm driving, Okay, like I'll see that when I'm driving. Same with like, you see piles of deer and I mean, you see tons of critters when you're driving, but yeah. Yeah. So, and then do you, would you generally be driving from home and back every day? Is that? Yep. Most of the time. Um, when we get back deep enough into the floodwoods there, if you get two and a half hours plus one way, it makes sense to, to camp. You know, if you start spending five hours, six hours plus a day driving, that's, that's a big chunk of your day. Yeah. So but, is that not, that's not uncommon to camp? No, in the summertime. Yep. Generally, we don't go back there unless it's summertime. That's okay. Yeah. And then how long would you be out there at a time? Let's say you're camping out there for the week okay. or sometimes come back Wednesday. I think that's what I would normally do. Like stay Monday, Tuesday, come back Wednesday and then stay Thursday night, come back Friday. So yeah. As otherwise that ends up being, I'm assuming you put in uh, like what time do you have to leave to get out where you're going? And yeah, two, three o'clock in the morning. And then do they, do you, you're getting back late at night? No, I mean, not terribly late. I mean, generally work eight to 10 hours, depending on if you have wood ahead of you or, you know, if I'm working right with a machine, it's generally around eight, eight, nine hours. That's still a long day. Yeah. Yeah. If you had drive a time, time, it's a long time. Yeah. And you've got a big family. Yep. So how has that uh, affected the way that you look at logging or? Yeah. So that's part of the reason I transitioned six, seven years ago to do private stuff on my own. So okay. I'd have more time. Um, and that worked really well. Is that more time because you're setting your own schedule? Yep. Okay. Yep. And more of it's, it's more local, you know, I can choose what jobs I take. So I'm generally within half an hour to 45 minutes from home. Gotcha. So even, even if I work a long day, I'm still not two, three hours from home. And that's, how, I guess, how does that work with private landowners? Is this generally somebody who's trying to improve their property, clear some trees out, or is it a cash kind of a, an income stream for these folks? Some of both. Yes. Yep. It can be, can be a number of things. Some people are looking for a spot to put their house. So they need, you know, two acres cleared okay. or yeah. they're looking to lower their fire danger. So they want to thin the timber out, um, you know, take the dead stuff out. And then, yeah, some people just need the money and need some loads of logs to make, make some dollars. So is it, is that generally relatively profitable for landowner? If they have a big enough piece, it, it is. Yep. If, if you've got a small piece, you know, a few acres, five acres, and you're only taking out 
two, three, four loads of logs, it's not a lot of money for the landowner because it costs a certain amount, like for me to move my, my equipment there oh, yeah. and start and all that. You know, if you only got two or three loads, there's generally not much money there at all. How does a, how does that work? You know, I'm familiar with on the agriculture side, you know, crop share kind of idea. Is it somewhat similar? Do you split proceeds with a, a logging company generally, or is it the kind of thing where you're just paying them a flat fee to, to do it for you? Or? So I've done both. It's generally, I pay, um, a certain amount per thousand board feet. So depending on how much volume they have, how hard it is to get it, um, you know, I'll give them a per thousand board foot logging rate. And then, so I set a logging rate and then each species of timber is valued differently. And so they can get more or less depending on the species of timber they have. So in that, in that case, when you say logging rate, you're buying it, are you essentially buying it from them? No. At a rate and then you're reselling it or you're, you take a margin. I take a margin. Yep. And okay. so the mill divvies out who gets paid. They pay me my logging rate and then the leftover gets paid to the landowner. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. And is that, do you have relationships with the mills and you take care of yep. all that kind of yep. stuff for I somebody? Do all the, I'll set up all the contracts, do the. Um, kind of like with a farmer. It's like. <clears throat> you, I've got the yep. farmer who farms our ground. I don't have to think about it. We just get, you know, they, they figure it all out and yep. work with CHS or whoever, and then sell the crop. And yep. Gotcha. Yeah. The landowner generally does nothing other than like sign a contract with the mill. Okay. What is, um, what about clear cutting? So, right. That's something that is kind of a bad word or perceived to be. Yep. And most uh, private, yeah, most private, People don't, don't do that. It's not something they like to do because it doesn't make sense for like family owned property. Um, it's the most economical way to log. That's why corporations do it. Um, you know, they move in, take everything, burn the slash, replant it all. And in 40 to 60 years, there'll be another crop there. And so it's the most economical because you can log it cheaper because you're taking a higher volume off of the acreage rather than going in and, you know, taking say a third or half your volume. Gotcha. It's a lot more work. And they can sell almost everything. Yeah. Something, most everything has a market of some kind. Yep. So yep. versus a, a landowner, a private landowner might be more selective of, Hey, we're going to take, you know, just these high dollar trees or we're going to yep. work around it. Yep. Or they may have, you know, certain, they want their, all their white for gone or, they want to keep all their big pine or something, you know. And you said 40 to 60 years, 40 years back, back in the floodwoods. Yeah. 40, 45 years. The, we did a pretty good size stand back there this summer. That was uh, like 40, 45 years, somewhere right in there. Okay. And is that, and that's cut. about as quick as it's going to happen. That's about as quick as you get it around here. And that, and that's really fast. Okay. There's just a high, they have a lot of moisture back there. Um, and, and it what was nice would, timber. What kind of timber was that? It was almost straight white fir or grand fir. Okay. And average DBH was like 16, 18 inches. And a lot of it was 20, 24 inches. Hmm. I mean, just super nice timber, super thick. Yeah, that's getting to the point where, I mean, somebody could have been, could have logged it yeah. twice. Several, right? several of the guys that we were logging with had been in there logging on that ground. Wow. Back when it was logged originally, and they're that's doing crazy. it again. So, wow, yeah, it's pretty. But neat. that's about as fast as it goes. Yep, around here, this is a lot drier. You know, the Palouse is a lot drier. Anywhere out here, you're going to be, yeah, sixty, sixty to eighty years. Hmm. That's a long. It's people. Are, that's a, a long you had cycle. a long term, yeah, yeah, yep. goal in mind, I guess. Yep, and that's why a lot of private, most private landowners, selectively thin their stuff and and take some of the older mature trees out and then the younger stuff keeps growing and it's maybe not the most economical to log it, but it keeps a stand of timber, keeps it healthy. It keeps them. They can recreate. They right. can still enjoy it. Yep. And that kind of thing. Yep. So if that, if you're doing something for that, I mean, have you, have you logged for somebody every five years or something or, or is it not generally that quick where I guess it depends on how little you, yeah, it depends on the size out. of ground and, and how much you take out. 
Um, I've got some, somebody I'm logging for now that I generally take some out every year, but I'm kind of working my way through, through the property. You know, I'm okay. not, I'm not logging the whole thing every year. I'm just thinning out certain areas and then moving next year to another section. So have you seen it change? I mean, you know, we talked about the, um, you know, moving from to bigger, better equipment, that kind of thing. But have mm-hmm. you seen that either the, the, um, I guess practices change or, um, or even just ground. I, I'm trying to think I'm trying to, um, yeah, I'm trying to word this question the right way. I guess I'm thinking about like, has, um, have you seen stuff like do things get logged out to where it changes how somebody's going to have to log it? Or, um, you know, if, if it's that long a time horizon, it's a renewable resource, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's like, are we, is like, are there areas where like, man, we've kind of taken everything out of there that we can for a while and we've got to just move on. So a lot of these areas, you know, um, up the blues, blues river area up there, a lot of that carpet ground. Yeah. is has been logged in the last 20, 25 years and it's getting pretty cut and it's going to be a long time before, you know, there's a stand of timber again in that area. I mean, they're going to, they're going to log themselves cells out of that area hmm. at some point. Yeah. And then they're just waiting right for a you long know, time. You know, they're doing either trying to do land land swaps with forest service or something to get other land or, you know, going back in the flood with where it's grown faster or harder to reach areas. So is that what land swap? Is that what happens a lot that forest service is kind of willing to take on stuff that's got a longer time horizon and yeah. Or they, they have some reason to want that piece of ground for some reason. Yeah. Hmm. How much of the ground do you know about like how much of the ground around here is corporate versus I national I forest? Like Would you log, did you ever log on, on federal ground yeah. too? Yep. I've logged on forest service and state ground both. Okay. Is it similar where they just, they'll contract with somebody and, and are they, do they think about it the same way? There's a lot more, uh, you're scrutinized a lot more, I guess like forest service particularly is you are kept a really close eye on it. Each log has to be stamped. I hmm. mean, it's, it's, it's a lot more work. And what's that? What's the reason for that? They track, they, they track everything. Oh yeah. Gotcha. They keep track all the, all the loads and everything. And is that less, do they clear cut on that ground? You can. Yeah. They, you know, they, they, do, they do both. Yep. Selective, selective cut and, and clear cut depending on what they're, what they're trying to do. It looks, you know, when you see like on a map, well, <clears throat> either when you're walking an area or, um, say like on satellite view, right. It looks like fairly square chunks, that kind of thing. Is there generally a size that somebody will come in and clear cut or is it, um, no, it can vary. I mean, we've done 10, 15 acre clear cuts, we've done 250, 300 acre clear cuts. Wow. So the one we're on now, I think it was 270. Okay. So it's a big chunk of ground. Yeah. Or it can be really small. Gotcha. So it just depends. Does that, is that somewhat dependent on what the owner? Yeah. I guess that's what the corporate timber company wants to do. Yeah. What they want to yep. get out what, of it. What they're looking for that ground, what they're trying to do with it. Has the, um, the change in let's, you know, last few years, obviously everybody's, you know, uh, at least, uh, the end user has seen insane lumber prices and s- serious volatility and that kind of thing. Did that trickle its way down to the logging business too? Very little. Okay. Very little. It's more slow and steady. Yep. Yep. No, when, when we had the big, big increases in, in lumber costs, you weren't getting paid a lot more. No, no. Like lumber costs tripled. We see a 10 to 15% increase. It's like really very minimal. Yeah. And that's not just labor. That's for like log prices. That's too? log prices at the mill. I mean, wow. I mean, I guess it did. It did peak probably. Oh, it may be 25% gain, but I mean, nothing like what the lumber market did. Yeah. There was a lot of people that was all in the middle. Yeah. There was some middle guys making, making some money. Interesting. Have you, have you ever seen in your 20 some years periods where 
prices just get so bad that nobody's really doing anything. Major slowdowns. Yep. Yep. So if prices get down to a certain point, it doesn't make sense for these private landowners to take their wood out. You know, if, if I'm charging $280 a thousand for a logging rate and prices come down to $350 or $400, you know, if they're taking a load of logs out and they're seeing 300, $400 for that load, it's just, that's not worth it. Yeah. When, you know, if they wait, wait till it goes up, they see a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks for a little logs, then it's worth it. Yeah. So Did it, the, it all depends. Would the, during those periods, would the corporate guys just keep logging? Most or of the time did stuff ever kind of shut down. Yeah. Back what was it? Oh eight, something like yeah. that. So that, that got hit really hard. A lot of people slowed down. All the private stuff pretty much stopped. Um, even the corporate, you know, the demand went to nothing. And so it, it slowed up pretty good for a solid year probably. And is, what did you do during that time? I gold panned quite a bit. Oh really? I, yeah. I spent like, I don't know, probably 150 hours gold pan in that year. Did that work out for you? <laughs> oh no, no. Like you don't make money, but it's a kick. It's a blast. Um, kids. Yeah. We had a plan. Can you do that time. around here? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Almost any stream around here. That's not, awesome. I guess not any, but. Did you find gold? Oh yeah. Just not enough to. Yeah. Not enough to, not enough to like actually make money. Make any kick. money. Yeah. You see the gold dust and try to get it out and put it in a vial. And yeah, it's fun. What, where, where do you, do you sell that then? No, no. Oh, you did. So not even enough to sell. Oh no, no, you no. Just like for fun. I, I bet, I bet I got a hundred dollars worth maybe in, you know, hundred plus hours. <laughs> so no, it's not about the money. It was fun. though. That's fun. Yeah. It was a kick. Yeah. Do you go way out to do that? No. No, not very far from the house. Oh, really? So. Yeah. So Gold Hill yep. is probably named yep. because of yep. gold. Mines and yeah. There's gold there. So but not enough clearly for people to no. to, not enough to mine it or, no. or anything like that. But if you dig around in a creek, you can generally come up with something in your pan. That's fun. That's pretty cool. So did did you ever have you done the star garnet thing? No. Never done that. We just did that this last year, this last summer. Um, that was super cool. We've wanted to. Yeah. It sounds cool. It was fun. I mean, it's a little curated, right? Because they, they have it all. The Forest Service has it all developed. And so they've clearly, they excavate from somewhere with an excavator. And they have these big old piles of gravel, right? And then they have a sluice and you go over there. And, and you work through it. And work through yeah. it. But it's pretty, it, it was surprisingly fun. Um, and cool. Like you come up with, you know, we've found some pretty good size wow. star garnets. I don't know what they're really worth if anything, but it's cool to, to see them, to find them and the kids can do it. And, yep. Yeah. And, and it's beautiful, beautiful out there. Yeah. Emerald Creek's pretty, pretty yeah. area. Yeah. It was cool. That was a, it was a fun thing to do and kind of get that North Idaho experience a little bit. Yep. Yeah. We've done the fossil. Have you ever done no. the fossils at the fossil bowl? No, where's that? Clarkie. So okay. right yeah. just outside of Clarkie. Um, they got a big race, a motocross track there. You can you can dig for fossils. There's fossils there. Whoa. That's pretty cool. And you found some? Yeah, we did that once. I, I found like a little pine cone or something that was fossilized. It was Whoa. It was That's pretty awesome. cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Something else to add to your bucket list. And <laughs> yeah. Kids had a blast. But there's I mean, a that was like 10, 15 years ago. But yeah. Well, there, there's so much to do around here and, and so much to get out to. Um, uh, did you, so you see a lot of animals. Are there like hunting opportunities being out in the woods? Generally. Yep. Um, I, I, I get busy enough during hunting season that I don't generally hunt a lot, but yeah, I've hunted while, while working occasionally. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty fun. That's cool. Like we bow hunted, a friend and I bow hunted. It's been eight, 10 years ago, back in the floodwoods there. And yeah, just left work. And Take a break from work and yep. go out and do it. Do you, have you been working with the same guys for a long time? Is there, is there a lot of turnover in the logging? There, there is. Yeah. There's quite a bit of turnover. Um, people change companies, change careers. I mean, a lot of the guys that burn out wear wear out. So yeah, it's some, pretty physical. Yeah, it's a pretty physical thing. Like hooking, working on a line machine. That's really hard on knees stuff uh 
so yeah, several guys have have moved out into construction or tree tree removal stuff like that. It's a little slower pace. Yep, slower pace. Self employed gives them more flexibility and not having to drive two three hours a day. So all that makes a difference. Yeah. Now, what about seasonality? You go. 24, no, it's not 24 seven. Well, some do, do some places have shifts and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've probably spent three years, maybe more than three years running processor at night. Oh, wow. Do a night shift. So, um, yeah, some companies run them, the processors mainly. That's one of the, the only things that they run 24 hours a day. Okay. So they'll get enough logs stacked up during the, tree, the day. Yeah, piles and piles of trees. Or and, trees. Yep, go in, you'll have, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 trees sitting there and Whoa. and just run 24 just hours a day. Just moving through them. Yep. Yeah. And so then are trucks hauling no. that whole time too? No. no, the trucks generally only work for 12 to 16 hours a day. Okay. And you, when you're processing, you're not loading them. That's a different, yeah, that's different, different piece of equipment. Yep. There's a log loader that, that loads trucks. Okay. How many logs fit on a truck? Uh, it all depends on the size. Um, oh, that's true. The, the tonwood stuff that goes to plumber up north, uh, you put 300, 350, maybe 400 logs on a load. Oh, wow. Um, and a nice big load of white fur going to Stimson might have four, five, six, seven, eight logs. I mean, mm-hmm. just it all depends on the size. Generally, How, how much weight is that? Uh, most standard trucks haul 80,000 pounds gross. Okay. Um, 86. I mean, that's... That's generally about the growth. So they're 20, anywhere from 26 to 28 tons, somewhere in there. Is it, Have you ever done that? The truck driving no. end of it? No. Or hauling? Never want to do that. Never. Yeah, no. So why is that? <laughs> uh, I just have never, yeah. Is that is that a dangerous, sketchy part it, of the business? It can be, yep, depending on where you're hauling it from. It seems like, I mean, yeah. I know I've driven logging roads in my pickup, and yep. I'm like, this is. Some of the roads are terrible. Um, yeah. And I'm just not built to, to do that. I just, I love driving. I do not want to drive a log truck. That's, that's a different breed. Does that, I mean, do you got, are there accidents relatively frequently? Do you guys go off the road? Uh, there's a fair amount. I would say not a lot. I mean, the guys that drive trucks are, they know what they're good doing. at it. Yeah. They're, I mean, they take those logging roads and make it look like nothing, but yeah. Yeah. I'll stick to driving my pickup on those. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Any other stories, any other crazy stories that Boy. are worth sharing? I don't know whether you protect the innocent with names or not. <laughs> uh, I think the last day I hooked hooked logs under a line machine, I almost died. That was the closest I came to dying. Had a tree, but didn't, did didn't you even die. get injured? Didn't get injured. Um, so I never, just a close call, just that close. Yep. Um, it was the last day I was hooking logs or trees, uh, sent a big red fir tree up. We were skidding at a bluff right below us. The tree caught the bluff, broke the choker tree came back down the hill. It was in brush. I couldn't really see it. Took off running the wrong way. Cause you could, you could just I could hear, hear it. it, could hear it and took off running the wrong way. Um, crossed a rock slide and like my hard hat flew off the tree actually hit my hard hat. It went right beside me on the left, just below me. I end up just outpacing my feet and just started tumbling. So, I mean, I guess I did kind of get hurt, but not by like the tree. Yeah. But yeah, it roared by me. I don't know. Six, seven feet away. It was a 36 inch red fur. Whoa. That was freaky. That's got to wake you up. That Yeah. How long ago was that? Boy, I don't even remember. Was that your last day? Was it supposed to be your last day or you were just like, I'm done after this? This was actually, I was going back to running stroker the next day and this was my last day hooking and it was, yeah. So that's what happens. That is the, that's the dangerous stuff is when something breaks free. Yeah. Tree comes back down 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 the hill, especially if you can't see it, you don't know where it's coming. Um, or what it'll kick, kick loose coming down the hill. If it'll kick, we were in a bunch of rocks, you know, Oh yeah. you can have rocks bust loose. There's been multiple guys that have died from, you know, rocks getting kicked up and coming down, hitting them. 
So, yeah, scary. And then those cables probably go flying too. Yeah, cables cables can break. You break a main line, have it come whipping up the hill, or have a skyline break. Have the carriage crash to the ground. Yeah, yeah, dangerous work. Yep, there's never never a lack for excitement. Do you miss running a saw at all? Do you still get to? I still get to. Yep. You're- yep. So like this winter, I've still got some private stuff I'm going to do. Okay. Um, so still got 10, 12, 15 loads I'm going to do this winter. And so and at that point, you're doing everything. All. Yep. You're cutting it. I'm falling you're- the tree. I'm going to use my wheel skidder. I'll use my old pull through dilemma, pull through that, cut it up into logs with a chainsaw. So yeah, I enjoy that. Still enjoy that. Yeah. And you're just by yourself. Yep. That doesn't bother you. You don't mind no, being out there no, all day by has. yourself. No. Do you listen to stuff? You listen to stuff while you're out there. When Do I'm you- in my machine, yeah, I'll listen to podcasts and eBooks yeah. and just music. And, is yeah. it? Do you have headphones? And is it pretty? Earbuds. It's, it's yep. a loud. It's loud decent. machine. It's not terrible. It's not terribly loud. When you're in the cab, it's yeah. Not when you're too in the cab, it's, cab is not bad. Okay. Just got earbuds. And- Are they they're heated and air conditioned oh, yeah. and all that. And- Yep. So it's not too bad. No, you could do that for a long time. Yep. 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 I can, I can sit in there when it's snowing and nasty and blowing and and watch the guys work outside and just stay nice and toasty. What are the guys when you like guys outside, what are they doing? So they're either hooking logs, like I'm on a line machine right now. So they're either hooking, hooking the trees down the hill or unhooking them on the landing, unbelling them. Yeah. So there's still a lot that has to be done by hand on the ground by hand. Because the other thing you mentioned, I was going to ask you about that, um, buncher, the buncher, feller buncher. Yeah. So that's there. That's a machine that will cut the tree that just fells it. Yeah. It fell, just falls. In. Okay. Cuts it and puts it on the ground in a pile. And that's replacing the guy running around the chainsaw. Yep. Yep. And is that, is there, are, is that pretty common? Yeah. Or do you no, have to have pretty ideal conditions to be able to run It doesn't have to be like ideal. That? It has to be manageable you know that they're a leveling machine so they they tilt up to a certain amount level the cab and the whole whole machine out um but yeah they they have their limits is that generally if you're clear cutting or will people use those for selective stuff too you you can you can use them for selective um it's generally done in a clear cut setting and is that the kind of thing where it'll cut it and tip it down it could control it yeah control it can it can buzz a tree off, pick it up, hold it there, and just lay it over wherever it wants. Hmm. So they're cool. Have that's, you ever run one no, of those? No, no. That's that's one of the very very few machines in the woods I have not ran. Which someday they look like a blast. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, I mean, I don't know. I'm one of those people. I, I never grew up. It's like equipment and big pieces of equipment, dump trucks, all that stuff. You're like, oh, super super cool. Yep. Yeah. So you, you enjoy running a machine. Yes. It's, it's a blast. And then, um, when you're not logging, you guys have quite the farm operation too. Yeah. We? Yeah. We got milk cows. No and, shortage of, of things to do. Yep. There's, there's lots of stuff at home. Picking up feeders, building, building stuff, remodeling. I don't do so much. I don't do hardly anything with the milking. Okay. It's more of the logistics, like feeding them and and even that, the kids do a lot of the feeding, the tractor and stuff. But And is milk cows new? That's a more recent thing. So we had milk cows for, I don't know, six, seven years. And then we got out of them when the boys started doing travel baseball. We got out of it for, I don't know, was it four or five years? Because you have that. to be You're going you all have the to time. Be there. You have to be there for, for milk cows. Yeah, it's twice a day. And yeah, they don't just, you don't just get a take a break one, one evening if you don't feel like milking them. So it's, it's a big commitment. And growing up though, you didn't, well, your cattle ranch, that was beef cows. So my grandpa always had a milk cow. Oh, he did? Yep. So there was always a milk cow around. I didn't do really do anything with it, but yeah, I was around it. But the beef cattle was more the, yep. The other part of the ranch, the yep. industry besides yep. logging. Yeah. Cause the milk cow, was, I mean, generally only just had one. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I guess you told your near death experience. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any other, any other closing thoughts on logging? 
Like, would you? Is it something you encourage, like your boys? You encourage them to get into it? Have they expressed interest? So yeah, I mean, what would you tell somebody if they were interested in getting into logging? I would say do it. Um, So it it is the the median age is getting older and older. There's there's less and less young people. Hmm. You know, when I started in the woods, there was a lot of kids, eighteen to twenty five, that were. I mean, that's you know, a lot of young people that were just out there working in the woods and now shoot, finding somebody under 30 is hard. Hmm. And so, yeah, if you've got the the gumption and want to actually work, it's try it. And there's a fair bit of demand. Yeah. Yeah. There's a decent demand. I mean, you have to be willing to work, but yeah, there's a big demand. Hmm. That's awesome. And so try it. Yeah. If you try it, don't like it, do something else, but yeah. Give anything a try. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Both of my boys have done it with me. Wyatt logged commercially this summer and then then transitioned to construction. And so, yeah. Yeah. Well, good opportunity to see the, see the country and well, and I've, I've enjoyed just learning about it. I mean, the last hour, just uh, because like I said, you, especially getting out hunting or whatever, you'll see logging operations, you run into that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and it's easy for it to just kind of be this mysterious thing that, you know, you don't really know what's going on or, or I've had the impression of, hey, there's logging going on over here. We shouldn't bother hunting anywhere near this area because it's probably blown all the game out. No, go ahead. And Not keep necessarily that. the case. <laughs> no, just keep thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot of people that think that. Like, yep, just keep thinking that. Yeah, Let's save them for the loggers. <laughs> yep, yep. We gotta, we gotta have some animals. That's right. Well, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, you bet. Appreciate the time. Yep. Well, all right. Thanks for joining us. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you next week.